Okay. Well, in 1857, uh, Chief Justice Lemuel Shaw of the Massachusetts Supreme Court had ruled that Betty Booth, a 25-year-old coloured slave, was declared as free. However, what transpired shocked everyone. Betty chose to return back to her masters and to remain as a slave. Now, Betty explained that she was treated well and fairly by her masters, and they are known as the Sweets. Okay, that's their surname, Sweets. All right. And she had made this decision entirely out of her own violation under no coercion from the Sweets. Well, personally, I believe that the owners really lived up to their name, la, very sweet people. La. But if I was Betty, if I was placed in her position, I would have picked freedom for sure. She probably felt that she could have a better life as a slave. Probably this was the life that she has ever, ever known. All right? That she ever knew. And she did not know what freedom men for her. So now Betty's case is used as a case study in law journals to, de to debate you know, whether having freedom to make contracts also means that one can choose to remain a slave out of their own violation. Now church, Betty had a choice. She made the choice to return as a slave and to give up her freedom because Betty believed that it was the better choice, pun intended. All right, similarly, when a prisoner all right, refuses to uh, leave the prison all right, at the end of their sentencing, all right, this is known as prisoner's syndrome all right, because they believe that it is better for them to stay on in prison due to the fear of the outside world that they will not be able to survive. They are worried of being stigmatized their inability to provide for themselves. Now, in today's passage, Paul also addresses this issue, all right, of believers, Christians, choosing to remain enslaved and imprisoned once again, even though they already have freedom in Christ. So, if we look at the passage today uh, that has been read to us in, uh, some, uh, in a very summarized, uh, focused points, um, in Galatians chapter 1, Paul was writing an introduction to the people, the Christians, and he's expressing his shock that they are now turning back to another gospel. And in uh, Galatians 4, we see that Paul argues passionately once again. He says, why must you have go back to such enslaving, all right, when you already have freedom? He says, why, why? And I tell you why. Because in that church, there were people who were known as the Judaizers, all right? They were teaching that on top of faith in Christ, you needed to have other things, all right? In addition to their faith, they needed to have other things in order to receive true salvation, all right? And throughout Galatians, in the book of Galatians, Paul explains that you are no longer bounded by such things of the law. The law was a burden. The law that you should follow is the law of love now, the law of Christ. And he encourages them to live in freedom, not to return back to their old ways in the legalistic observations and observances of customs, laws for salvation. And Paul tells them, do not be led astray by this group of Judaizers. All right, and so that is the context. So the key issue here that Paul is addressing in Galatians is the issue, the main question is, why do you want to be enslaved in legalism when you are already freed in Christ? And so basically, Paul is asking them, are you right now making the better choice? So church, in what ways are the Christians in, Galatians, uh, in Galatia enslaving themselves all right, through this false gospel? How are they en uh, enslaving themselves? I'd like to share in three points. They believe that legalism with Christ is better than liberation in Christ. They also believe that they needed to trust in their flesh. It is better 
than having true faith in Christ and Christ alone. And they also felt that in, by doing this, it's better to, to, to remain slaves to the law rather than being sons of God through Christ. So these are the three ways that I would like to expound in this sermon moving on. So let's move on very quickly to the first point, legalism versus liberation. All right, and in our passage, it says here, formerly when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, how is it that you're turning back to those weak and miserable forces or principles? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days, months, and seasons, and years. And so in these verses, Paul is writing to them to say that from the start, before you even knew God, all right, you were following deities. You were following Greek deities, Zeus, Hermes. These were not even true gods at all. And through these false religions, through these false regulations, you are being held captive. You are imprisoned. You are enslaved. And he says, do you want to go back to such a life again? Now that you have already have freedom in Christ. So he contrasts, well, a bit small. Okay. So he contrasts this argument in Galatians chapter 4 by using the illustration of Sarah, Isaac, Hagar, and Ishmael. All right. He contrasts it by saying that those Judaizers who are influencing you now, they are saying, you know, you've got to go back to the Old Testament laws and say that if, let's say, they are arguing on the fact that you need to uh, have regulations based on the Old Testament law in order to have salvation, okay. Paul says, okay, I'll take up that debate with you from the Old Testament. And therefore, Paul uses the Old Testament story of Sarah, Isaac, Hagar, Ishmael to argue his case. And he says here in verse 21, he says, tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? So he's saying here, you all want to be under the law? Sure, by all means. Do you know what the law says? And he goes on to say, For it is written in the law that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and one by the freed woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as a result of a divine promise, faith. And these things are being taken figuratively. The two women represents the two covenant. So specifically, he mentions that the slave woman, which is Hagar, all right, and the son, who is Ishmael, is the offspring of slavery. All right, and they represent the covenant of Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is where God gave his law. All right, law reveals our sin. Law shows us where we are wrong. But law cannot free us from sin and wrongdoing. In fact, we are enslaved by the law because the law will keep condemning us, will keep telling us you're wrong, you have, you, have, you have stepped out of line, you have done wrong. On the other hand, Sarah is the free woman. She is the mother to Isaac, the one that is chosen, the freed one. And over time, Jesus Christ, the one who will come and liberate us from such laws and sin would come from the line of Sarah and Isaac. And so Paul argues and concludes it is futile to follow the law in order to be made right in front of God because justification comes only by faith, true faith in Jesus Christ. So he asks, why do you want to be slaves again to all these worldly principles and law now that you already have freedom in Christ. So that is the first point. We see that these Judaizers were teaching that it's better to be enslaved. It's better to follow legalism rather than to taste true liberation by faith. And therefore, Paul asked them, why? Why do you want to do that? Why do you want to live this kind of life? Yes, do you all know why? Why? Why do you think that the Christians choose to live this kind of life? Because they trusted in their flesh. I'd like to offer a suggestion why. 
It is because of the propensity of men to rely on our own works in order to justify ourselves rather than faith in Christ's work on the cross. And this is very prevalent, all right, especially in the Singapore culture where we are taught that you need to fight for what you need. You want this, you must do work hard. You know, if you don't work hard, you don't deserve it. Trusting in the flesh for salvation, relying on one's own abilities to receive salvation instead of relying upon God. Now, this was exactly what the prophet Jeremiah says. Cursed is the one who trusts in men, who draws strength from mere flesh and whose heart turns away from the Lord. Again, we look at verse 23 in chapter 4, in which Paul argues again. All right, and this is something that's very interesting. Huh? Okay, Paul says his son by the slave woman. Who is the son of the slave woman? Ishmael. Who's the slave woman? Very good. All right. And he says that his son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh. But his son by the free woman, who's the free woman? Who's the son of the free woman? Isaac, right? And was born as a result of divine promise. But yet, you look at this, interestingly, okay? When this was done, when he had made that mistake, you know, he says this. He still tried to negotiate with God, all right? He says, God, please let Ishmael be the son that you promised. Please let Ishmael be the son that you promised. So what does this mean? You see, Abraham in this statement did not deny the fact that there is a promise. He believed in the promise. However, he would like to replace the promise with a man-made uh, idea or a man-made action, right? And so he says, please let Ishmael, which is man-made, true flesh, be the son you promised, which is supposed to be divine, true faith. So Abraham sought to mix the two of them up. Similarly, in Galatia, the Judaizers that were influencing the Christians at that point of time said, on top of faith, yeah, go on, believe, believe in what God says. But on top of that, mix it up with some things, lah. You know, you need to do something to prove, lah, right, that you are worthy of God. You know, circumcision, lah, follow the Sabbath laws, lah, you know, do this, do that. On top of that, on top of faith in Christ. To them, faith alone is not enough. One still needed self effort. Now, why do that? Paul says, why must you do that? When the free gift of salvation is through faith and faith alone. And because they have done all these things, they choose to continue to be uh, 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 under legalism, they choose to rely on their flesh. What is happening is this, is that they continue to be slaves to the law. One is choosing to remain a slave rather than to have freedom as a child of God. And again, Paul argues empathetically in uh, 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 chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. Okay? And I highlight just 6 and 7. He says that because you are his sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts and the spirit who calls out Abba Father. No longer are you a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. All right, and okay, I, I, I will not be labeled too much on this, but if you look at Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 to 7, he gives another illustration, the illustration of uh, 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 the, 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 the inheritance. Okay, and so basically what he's saying here is that in those Greek days, there's this inheritance law. All right, there's this inheritance law whereby basically you have a son who's ready to receive the inheritance of the father, but because he's a young child, he's unable to receive the inheritance until a certain age. And therefore, he says that because of this, all right, the child is still living under the law because the law says that you cannot receive the inheritance until you reach a certain age. You understand what I'm saying? Right, okay? And so what he's saying here is that it is similar. Back then, our law, okay, the Mosaic law, 
is also preparing us towards the inheritance. It's showing us that we can't get it, you will not get it until you reach that time that God has appointed, until you reach the time where you are to receive that inheritance. And therefore, he says that because the law continues to show you that you are unable to get it, you wait with anticipation of the time that you'll be able to get it. That's when Christ comes. All right? And so he was giving this illustration. All right? He says that the law was necessary to show us our sinfulness. But it is also necessary to show us that we are waiting for in hope for the Messiah. And so the law, as much as it is good, it is unable to free us until we reach that appointed time where we receive that inheritance that is Christ Jesus. And therefore, Paul argues, why now that you have already received that inheritance, you choose to... Uh, tombale, is it? Tombale, or what? What was that? Reverse means called what? Go stun, go stun, okay. Okay, go stun and then go back to being the one that is under the law that you haven't received the inheritance. You have already reached the age of receiving it. Why do you still want to go back? So basically, that's what he's arguing. Why do you remain a slave when you are already a son? And so church, now that I've shared these three points, maybe you're asking me, Pastor, what are you talking about? Right, so what? <laughs> okay. I'm going to go to the so what now. Why be enslaved when you are already freed? And we've seen that they have enslaved themselves through practicing legalism rather than having liberation. They are trusting their flesh versus faith in Christ. Being slaves instead of being sons through Christ. And what I want to say here is this. I want to ask this question. How many of you believe, right, that salvation is Christ, a faith in Christ and Christ alone and nothing else? Believe or not? Put your hands. Believe. Who believe? Okay, so that those never put up hands don't believe, is it? Your belief, lah, I believe that as Christians, you all go through baptism class, all this confirm. If not, your baptism class has not been good enough. All right? Faith by faith, uh, sorry, faith in Christ alone. All right? And I believe that you're not like the Galatians. Who say, ah, we've got some Judaizers here teaching us this, ah, we should do this, we should do that. Christ, faith in Christ alone is not enough. No, okay? So we are done with that, ah. Okay? So I assume that you all know that, okay? All right? And so therefore, what does this sermon have to do with you? There could still be a danger in how we live our Christian life because some of us can still fall into that legalistic trap. For example, a mindset that some Christians have is that, yes, I'm saved by the grace of God apart from works, faith in Christ, and I am a better Christian because of some things that I do more than you because of some classes that I attended more than you. Okay, because of some things that I do more than you. I pray more than you. I pray harder than you. I sing better than you. I serve more than you. All these things. And my halo is brighter than yours. All right, if all of us have a halo here, actually everyone's halo is the same, okay? All right, regardless of how many year old Christian you are, how many boards you have served in, in church or whatever, it doesn't matter. Pastors are also the same as you. Maybe dimmer, lah. okay, but anyway. <laughs> Alright, because we are judged doubly, right? <laughs> Alright. So, there is still a chance that we are still practicing legalism even though we already have tasted freedom. So, let me just ask you some hypothetical questions. Recently, I've been using this term hypothetical a lot. Alright, let me use this. <laughs> Those who know, knows, okay? <laughs> All right, let me ask you some hard questions. What would be your first thought if you see a fellow church member after service? He goes down, he walks to the Block 350 coffee shop. Then he goes to the smoking corner, then he starts smoking. Tell me, what's your first thought? Okay, just, just leave it there. Don't have to tell me. Don't have to tell me okay? <laughs> or how would you feel uh, suddenly one newcomer walk in, right? Tattoo or angkong everywhere. Angkong, right? Yeah, yeah. Everywhere. What, 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 what is your first thought? First thought. Or what if 
you happen to hear from someone who hear from someone who hear from someone they say that, wow, you know what, this person uh, recently divorced, you know? What's your first thought? Or what if someone come into church and say, oh, this is my partner, we just got married. Or they say, oh, very good, very good. Uh, which church are you from? Oh, I'm a non-Christian. Then you look at the Christian. What's your first thought? So, uh, okay, I'm, I'm treading on a bit of uh, thin ice here. Is tattooed Christian a lesser Christian? Is a smoking Christian a lesser Christian? Is a divorcee Christian a lesser Christian? Are they lesser beings in the body of Christ? Will we start to ostracize them? Will we start to distance ourselves from them? Now, what honors and glorifies God more? Cutting them off or embracing them and loving them more? Again, don't misquote me. Ah. Don't misquote me. I say it again because this live stream and then recorded. Ah. Don't misquote me. I'm not saying we close both eyes and not to deal with such challenges when the church encounters them. It is challenging. But do these things matter in the eyes of God when salvation is by faith and faith alone? Okay, I'm not saying, I'm not saying sanctification, I'm saying justification, uh, salvation. Uh, okay? Faith in Christ and Christ alone, not by the deeds of men. And for us as Christians, how then do we help one another in the journey of sanctification? How then do we embrace and engage in love, truth, grace? You know, I remember very, 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 very clearly, okay? Uh, I was in a church, all right, and I was, okay, I wouldn't say what age I was, then you all will know which church, okay? But uh, I was in the church, and it was a discussion, and we were, there was a heavy debate, a long debate, there was a very passionate debate between, like, like two camps, all right, in, in, in the church. One saying that we should do outreach to a certain group of people, that are very, in the eyes of society, very unsavory. Another group will say that, why do we want to do such things? We want to invite them into church. So it was going on, left, right, left, right, until one leader stood up and said this. Why would we want to invite cockroaches to the church? Oh, I tell you, I sit down there, look, wow. Why do we want to invite cockroaches into the church? I think it was just... It's just too heated already. I just, sometimes we just say things that we don't mean. Okay? See, church, sometimes as Christians, we can be so preoccupied in the faith journey uh, that the faith journey becomes obeying rules, regulations, being prim and proper. And we conceive of Christianity as a series of do's and don'ts. Cold, and deadly set of moral principles. Someone once said, the essence of Christian theology is faith and grace. The Christian legalist isolates the law from the God who gave the law. The Christian legalist isolates the law from the God who gave the law. He's not so much seeking to obey or honour Christ but he's seeking to obey the rules and he becomes devoid of personal relationships. There's no love, there's no joy, there's no life, there's no passion in the journey of a Christian legalist. It is a mechanical, law-keeping, focused life, focused only on obeying rules, ignoring the spirit of love, grace, and God's redemption. Because you must remember, what's the point of the law? The law was to show us where we are wrong and points us to Christ. Redemption in Christ. So church, are we Christian legalists? Because if we are, not only are we enslaving ourselves, but we are enslaving others by pointing out, hey, you, why you never do this? Why you never wear this? Why you, why you wear like that today? Ah, yeah. You know, and all this kind of thing, it becomes like all these legalistic actions and attitudes pulls us down and we are enslaving each other more and more. 
Again, uh, please don't misquote me. Uh, I'm not saying we don't deal with those challenges. We must. But I'm saying what's the spirit of it, how we approach it, okay? So in conclusion, church, while God does expect Christians to live in a certain way that brings Him glory, and God also expects us to keep certain rules, for example, do not steal, uh, do not act in anger, etc., etc., but take note that such spirit of such rules are founded in love upon one another to unite and hold on to the unity in the body of Christ. So ultimately, God's acceptance of us is based off the righteous work of Christ, not on our ability to keep the law and not upon the ability to live righteous, perfect lives. Church, remember, we are no longer enslaved by the need to base our relationship with God upon man-made rules and regulations which often stifle and just suffocates everyone. Rather, let us be empowered by the fact that we have freedom in Christ. No longer do we focus on just the do's and don'ts, but rather we focus on what Christ has done. Let us not focus on the do's and don'ts, but rather be focused on what Christ has done and to be led by the spirit of love. Let us be empowered by what the spirit wants us to do. So church, I pray that we will be a people, a church that extends empowerment and not continue to enslave one another. Let us no longer be tools and angel, uh, age, agents of enslavements like the Judaizers but rather let us be channels of love, encouragement, and empowerment. So church, we are no longer enslaved, but we are empowered. Empowered in Christ, through Christ, and together in the body of Christ. So church, that is the true gospel of Christ. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we give thanks to you once again for your words that brings us freedom, your words that brings us life and love. And yes, even though there are times where we may have fallen short, and there are times that in our actions and the things that we do and say do not bring you glory, but God, help us to see one another through the eyes of Christ. Help us to treat one another with love, with grace, and with patience. And help us to each and every one of us continue to be surrendered to the Spirit that will show us our rights and wrongs. Because we are children of God. We are able to cry out, Abba, Father. You love us. You will guide us. And we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. We are a family in Christ Jesus. We are a family. So Lord, help us to love one another as a family. Help us to love one another as brothers and sisters. Help us to love one another because you have first loved us. In Jesus' name, amen.